Before we begin the episode, I would like to thank our sponsor, Actimet, an athlete wellness and performance monitoring system. Actimet allows players to share their training load, training intensity and highlight issues away from sport, empowering management to help players in a safe, secure and private manner. Players input their performance and wellness data on an easy-to-use mobile app. Actimet is an affordable monitoring system at less than €50 Euro a month and is currently used by county and All-Ireland champions and over 50 soccer academies worldwide. For more information, please visit actimet.com for more. Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 66, I am delighted to be joined by Irish Senior Soccer International and Qualified Dr. Kira Grant. Since recording this podcast, Kira has made history and signed a professional contract with Rangers Football Club in Scotland. Kira is one of the most impressive and most talented guests I've had on today, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hi Kira, thanks a million for joining me on the podcast. Thank you very much, Orla. Lovely to be here. Before we get into everything, I like to give the guests 30 or so seconds to give their sort of elevator pitch introduction for the listeners who might not know who they are. <laughs> Um, so Kira Grant, uh, hail from Donegal, living in Dublin now the last eight years. I am a footballer for Shelburne and um, the senior women's national team and also qualified as a doctor. And um, yeah, that's kind of mostly part of me. <laughs> Growing up, um, who got you involved in sport? Uh, who were who was the biggest influence for, at that point? Um, I suppose probably unconsciously it was my older brother and my dad um, my three brothers two younger one older and you know there's photos of me in the house with a ball and you know bandages on my knees from maybe three upwards um, I luckily grew up in, just in the outskirts of Letterkenny but we had a football pitch that I don't know would have been classified as an actual pitch but we played there for about 15 years. it was a hill we used to tactically use the puddles and the trees on the sideline um, you said sometimes you had to take throws off the ground because the trees were in the way um but no so that was right next to my house and then at the bottom of the street there was five or six astroturfs that used to have training sessions on three four times a week um Anthony, Anthony Gorman ran like uh, training sessions Monday Wednesday Friday um so I suppose like I don't really I can't say when a moment or who I just mum said my parents are very cool and open people and if I came home from school, my friend was learning the piano. I wanted to try the piano. They'd let me try that for a week or two until I <laughs> decided I was no good at the piano. Um, and then, so I played like basketball, soccer, Gaelic, athletics, women, karate. Like I did, I think I lasted in Irish dancing for about 10 days. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so just pretty much anything. I, I, yeah. As you can tell, I didn't like to sit still too, too yeah. often. Yeah, definitely not. And when did you start to focus in on, on soccer and Gaelic? Because I know they were kind of your focus for a couple of years. I suppose in school, um, you know, soccer definitely was always always the first love, and I was known in all the Gaelic teams as a soccer player, and right. probably for the way I played Gaelic, and you know, for for my um, just love of it. But um, in secondary school, then you really, you know, it was just getting a bit too much. Like at one stage, I was playing three different sports with school teams and club teams, yeah. and I got really, really bad shin splints and TY that to the extent where I had to take a rest from sport for about five months. Yeah, yeah it was really bad. I could barely get up the stairs in school. Oh, um, and then um, we were doing really well with the international under 17s team. And once we got through the first qualifying round, I think we all kind of consciously then made a decision that like, you know, if we want to get to the Euros or if we want to get to the World Cup, we're going to have to make some sacrifices. And that's when I really started focusing on soccer. But in Donegal, you know, there wasn't much happening. Bridge McGinty had set up a lot of the women's stuff. But our Irish manager at the time had also let us still play for Donegal because the training sessions were so well structured and intense. And then coming up to the soccer competitions, it was all it was all soccer. Mm-hmm. Um and then once I hit university, it was, you know, one or the other. Um yeah. And yeah, that's why I got a soccer scholarship to UCD and that was it. Um, I didn't play for another six years, I think, after that. Yeah. And do you think there was much benefit in keeping up? Like I know, for example, with the shin splints, obviously that's not ideal. You don't want that to happen. But was was there a benefit of you playing not only multiple sports growing up, but until teenage years, having three different sports together? Absolutely. Um, Like everything complements everything, really, you know, 
basketball I only started playing it when I was 12 when the local club was starting up and they came to our primary school and to be honest I absolutely love basketball it's one of my favorite sports but even if you think about the footwork the pace of thought the pace of pass everything you know the intermittent training that you're getting done without you even realizing it um definitely helped me in my soccer say technical ability in soccer vision in soccer and then you know Gaelic again it's just such a great sport it's it's just like everybody in Ireland I think loves Gaelic but um yeah like I think they all complement each other but it definitely does get to a point like as you said I was playing you know potentially oh six seven games a week plus training sessions it's just not doable um you know and then you start realizing or like it gets to a stage where you're kind of plateauing and you're you know you're just tired and you're not really playing well like I remember going up to school's training session at Sloan and you know the manager was giving us all feedback and he turned to me and he was like and you you need to rest because I think I think I'd gone to like an Ulster basketball training session for like three hours on the Friday night and it's like oh and then drove to Athlone to train with the Irish team for like three hours and I was just you know yeah. I was yeah you know my mom was like yeah you're a lunatic but there was no telling the otherwise yeah. but, but I think now teenagers like even talking to the girls in Shelburne they have such a better understanding of even diet nutrition training types of training rest and recovery like we we had a clue like we were yeah. just you know just going with the flow saying yes to everyone around us and you know and it does boil up at a point yeah definitely if there's any younger girls or, or guys listening that kind of realize do you know what that sounds a bit like me and I haven't hit the point where I'm getting shin splints or any other injury uh, how do they kind of make that decision in terms of not to quit sports but to try balance everything because I definitely think there's a benefit of keeping multiple sports up but it's and as a coach I'm now trying to figure out with players how do I how do we approach the conversation of look you need to actually just take a rest and, and balance everything out yeah, I suppose, so on reflection, like even, you know, over the years when I've been thinking about it, I think once the thoughts kind of start entering your your mind of, oh, I don't want to do this anymore, you know, or like, yeah. you know, there's always days where you're really, you don't want to go out in the blistering cold to the <laughs> session, but there's a difference between that and then it going on for four or five days or maybe one or two weeks where you're like, I'm really, I'm getting pulled in all directions here, because especially yeah. like, especially in Gaelic scene, like the young, young, talented, say 14, 15 year olds could be on their schools you know, like under 16 team, senior team, club, 16, 17s, 18s, even up 21 senior. So there's a lot of a lot of people want the best for you, but also sometimes want the best out of you. And I think with that awareness and training, I know the GEA are doing a lot of it and even the FAI of just yeah, that kind of player coach education as well. And, you know, the signs of burnout, the signs of stress, because you know, and then you add on a pandemic as well. So a lot of teenagers are probably under even more stress than we were. Um, but I think I think once you hit around 15, 16, even sometimes 14, depending on, on what level you're playing at, decisions do have to be made. And I suppose it all depends on the person. Then if they want to play elite level, um, it is definitely getting mainstreamed at a lot younger age. If you want to compete with the best, then you're going to have to dedicate all of your your time to that sport. Um, but if you're more of a recreational athlete, I think it's just about finding that balance um, and then just when you're recovering, recover right. Yeah, I love the way even you said there, it's either people want the best for you or the best out of you. And I think that's something players can kind of remind themselves of. Um, talk us through a little bit of college. Was that the point you, you obviously focus on soccer? But what was the time like? Because I know you took a break uh, for a couple of years, was it at some stage? Yeah, and um, that was kind of um, coming to the end order. That was so. Yes, yeah, so I arrived at UCD in two thousand and ten, the end of two thousand and ten, and so luckily got an Ad Astra scholarship, which was top class. Like, I ended up living with you know some amazing athletes like you know Paul Donovan, Kieran McGee, and um, Katie Mullen. Like you know, right. it goes on. It, it, oh, it's it's incredible. Noel McGrath, Killian Buckley, like yeah. everyone. We were all just living living in the same apartments, um. So that environment straight away to me was quite elite. Um, it helped me bridge the gap from underage international to senior international and by second year in college I'd made my first cap for Ireland and um, it was lovely balance with soccer with the college work and soccer um everything was in kind of almost a triangle between our building our um sorry our accommodation the building and the gym okay um, brilliant. you could get naps in you could you know pick and kind of choose what you're going to do we had a one-on-one snc coach um, you know, we had access to kind of all sports science and laboratory and stuff as well. But 
yeah, and even exam kind of like they help us. I remember one time me and my friend Dora Gorman, who was on the Irish team as well, we did an exam in Irish camp where an invigilator came out. So like wow. things like that. Yeah, they really tried to get the whole elite athlete balanced and the likes of Keir McGee was able to and Paul Don, I think, spread some of their years. So instead mm-hmm. of doing a year in 12 months, they did it in 24 months, just allow them for training in whatever competitions they had. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it was just all coming up, coming again, kind of like those teenage years. Um, it was kind of getting to the stage near the end of my final year in college where I was just I was just wrecked, I think, and I was starting to not enjoy football anymore. It, it became that thing where I had to do and I suppose there was some external pressures on me to keep playing and obviously when you've been playing your whole life to even consider not playing it is is something you know it's kind of a lot of athletes have to go through but it's it's quite hard um yeah. so yeah so I took the, the the league was luckily changing from a summer or winter league to summer league so it worked out perfectly so with Christmas and my final year I decided not to go back for my last semester, knowing that it was a big, big six months for me. And then we were starting our internship. Um, but then Orla, in, I think about three weeks after I decided I was not playing soccer, I joined the UCD B Gaelic team. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was the best crack ever because they were all in first or second year. And I was the, yeah. the old in sixth year. They were like, I didn't even know college went to six years. And I was like, I know. Um, and, I, and it was just a new lease of life for me because yeah. I had no pressure on me. It was crack they were carefree kind of you know younger yeah. younger girls coming in and yeah and kind of relit my love for Gaelic as well and then within a few months um Maxi Curran had kind of called me and was asking me back in the Donegal setup so then um at the start of 2019 so no 2018 sorry in January I went and um went back playing for Dublin or for Donegal and we beat Dublin in our first game in Crow Park so and that's yeah. probably there was one of the highlights of my Gaelic careers um but yeah so that was kind of the college scene and look I would absolutely recommend anybody to go to UCD um you know and DCU I hear great things about DCU as well but just the dedication they're putting towards our athletes and student athletes is is great and you can do both and you know you see the likes of you know there you have Paula Donov- Paul Donovan, Katie Mullen, like, you know, absolutely yeah. excelling in both. So it, it can be done. I love the way you mentioned the Dublin uh, loss there. It's all right, Kerr. Um, <laughs> in terms of living with the, the, that calibre of athlete, that's really interesting. And I'd say I've heard of, of other athletes the same and this environment that's created. Was there anything in particular you picked up from living with, with that calibre of, of athletes? Like you mentioned three Olympians there straight off yeah. the bat. I think, like, especially Kira McGean is somebody that I always think back on because when I was living with her, she had her really bad Achilles injury. Yeah. And I can't explain to you the dedication and hard work and focus she had to get back. Grueling gym sessions of kind of repetitive, monotonous exercises to get that Achilles going again. And then for only the rehab to fail, to try some injections to go for a surgery. And she just kept working, but also maintained such a lovely persona and... You know, she's the bubbliest. Everything you see in the media about Kira is who Kira is. Like she's just loves, loves her homeland, loves Kamogi, and you know she's just uh, she's incredible. And then the likes of you know, for me, even say Paul Donovan, like weight categories and things like that, and things you have to think about. And even just individual athletes, they're a whole yeah. other you know kettle of fish. Then <laughs> yeah, they really are. They really are. Their mindset is. You know, sometimes I'm like, whoa, you people are crazy. <laughs> but also I'm like, whoa, that's very admirable. And yeah. definitely have, you know, as the, the older I've gotten, the probably the things I've taken off them have, have mm-hmm. definitely come into light. Um, and it's great, even like when I got back in the Irish team, like, you know, I bumped into Katie Mullen in the hotel we were staying in. And it's just like even talking to her and it was just, she'd just come back from, you know, the Olympics and all. And just to have those connections and even Jeremy Dunk, Jeremy Duncan, a hockey player I played with, um, he was similar to me. He kind of took a few. He actually took a bit longer out from the Irish scene, Irish scene, and then he got himself back up to fitness, and then he went over to Belgium to play, and now he's back in the Irish setup. So, mm. you know, it's just even to ha- like, yeah, as you said, you couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better network of people. Like, it's it's incredible. Yeah, exactly. Um, you did mention um getting into college. I I skipped a step because I I always love um talking through kind of secondary school leaving cert stage because a lot of my listeners would be of that demographic um yeah. talk us through deciding to do medicine what was the what was the thinking behind it and how did you balance everything and studying because it's not like you didn't do anything to study for leaving cert you got the the top course uh, yeah look I or I think everyone's so different um so I never really had medicine on my mind um when mm-hmm. I got those suspense and TY I was thinking physiotherapy pretty much just because I was working with a lot of physios I enjoyed it and then, you know, as I kind of painted, like I was quite a 
a relaxed teenager. Um, I never put too much pressure on myself, but I was also, I was like, you know, I even think I worked harder back then than I do now sometimes. But every hour to me was just time that I could use. So between school, I'd stay in school for an extra hour and a half to get my work homework done. I'd have brought, you know, preparation. I'd have brought some food. My mom would have picked me up, brought me to train in and then after training. And like, I even think back at the crazy things. We used to watch Desperate Housewives in the house <laughs> or Lost or whatever was on. And every 15 minute break on RT, I would either like run, you know, dry my hair that I had the shower before and then come back next break, run, brush my teeth. And then as soon as it was over, I was like, okay, night family, bye. Like, I was, like, I was definitely, definitely a bit crazy. But like then on Saturdays, you know, I used to go to all the 18ths and stuff, um, you know, like have well as much of a social life as I could. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I'd get up early on a Sunday, get four hours of study done, and then that would be me done for the day. Right. And then I'd be ringing my friends being like, do you want to go for a drive or something? And they're like, you're like, are you not studying? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm done. Oh, yeah, I'm done today. And, but lots of my friends were like, well, I only got up at like one o'clock. And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, well I got up for like five hours. So, you know, so it's just kind of making use of your time. Yeah. But then also being kind to yourself and just being yeah. like, I've done enough this week. Um, and then like, you know, see if you've had a busy day, a busy few weeks or even a day in school and studying. Um, getting out there on the pitch um, is just the best thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, I, and even as like kind of subtle motivations to work, you're like, okay, I have a match on Saturday. I need to get this all done before the match because I don't want to be thinking about it before the match. Yeah. Or I used to kind of get travel sickness, but then I figured out if I put in my earphones and listen to music, I could get a bit of work done on the buses too, especially going from Donegal for yeah. for getting quickly to be traveling the length of the country. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just setting setting a focus and definitely do not drop the sports you're playing. Like if anything, take up sports for people who don't play too much sports. Exercise is the best thing you can do. Yeah. Um, and then just planning. So on a Sunday night, sit down and watch your plan for the week. What are your academic things you have to do? And then watch sport and uh, you know trend you have mm -hmm. and then night before get the bag set out um you know whatever clothes you need boots whatever for the day um done the night before so when you wake up you just grab your stuff get a breakfast and head out the door yeah uh, but I, or I had great support systems around me like my teachers when I went away like I missed the first five weeks of leaving cert okay um, right because we were away at the world cup and I had teachers you know meet with me after school for one-on-one -on -one sessions I had stuff sent over to me you know kind of week one over there try and get these questions done in week two and then I also so like you know say Dora Gorman I mentioned like she was very very academic she got the highest you know points in Ireland whereas for me I'm like I'm not that academic but I am quite hard working and as I said organized but then I made the decision after TY I was like I'm not good at languages why would I try and struggle to maybe yeah. you know a C or high C I don't know what the, the grades are have all changed now yeah um so and again my parents trusted pretty much anything that I wanted to do so I dropped to pass French and pass Irish took up LCVP because I knew if I could do all the work in fifth year I'd try to get a distinction that was the equivalent of like got an LCVP I did that as well yeah. it was great great one for this, the extra point <laughs> And then I just picked the subject that I knew I liked. Like I loved art, loved art, but it was going to be too much work um, and I just didn't have the time. So I, so I dropped that as well. And I just kind of played the leaving cert like a game. It was a bit practical. <laughs> and since then, I've had a few of my like, you know, friends or sisters or even friends yeah. of mine that are younger who did the same thing. They dropped their language to lower because they could spend hours and hours throughout the two years and still only scrape maybe a C1. Yeah. And it's just not worth it where you can put that energy and time that's already limited from your sport yeah. into something else. So. You're right, it is a strategy in a game, but I'm really impressed with even like, like I'm the total opposite. If I had an hour, I'd be like, oh my God, how am I going to get anything done in an hour? And I'd spend the whole hour contemplating how I'd get nothing done and then have to leave and then actually do nothing. But well, how, that's like, not all in my adult life. <laughs> I can make my life I didn't. <laughs> but how, where did you learn that from a young age? Like your, even your like attitude and like drive just seems to, was that always there? I honestly don't know because you know my my parents I don't think they instilled it in me my older brother definitely didn't um <laughs> uh I don't know I think the Irish setups like you know when you're a young age and you get these opportunities even interventionals to mix with people from all over the country you come from a small town and suddenly you realize whoa there's so many more talented people out there who even though like you might be the best person at sport in your town at your age group then you meet somebody else and you're like whoa they're they're way better than me they're like you know, so you learn stuff off them as well. Um, and yeah, like I suppose like, you know, some of those people, like on my under 17 Irish team, we have 
I think three doctors, two physios, solicitor, you know, like wow. it was a radiographer, like it was quite a academic group. But I also think, you know, we pushed each other a little bit um, in a very, very good way and kind of supporting way. And I suppose even for me, the encouragement to, to go for physio and go for medicine, mm-hmm. whereas I would have been like, absolutely, like, even some of my teachers, I think, were like, Excuse- sorry, what? Like, <laughs> no. Even like one of my best friends when I got into medicine was like, nah, you didn't. And I was like, yeah, I <laughs> that's so funny yeah Yeah, and I love the way you attribute that to to your environment and setup like even when you mentioned the Irish team there because I I had a really good chat with Damien Hughes and we were talking about how environments and exposing kids to environments at a young age can really influence them and that seems to be like even even now with the Irish team like you look across and professionals will obviously they play professionally so that's obviously going to elevate your game but from a younger age that seems to be really like just getting out of Donegal and and seeing even like you mentioned the World Cup that must have just expanded your your mind and your attitude even just yeah, see different cultures, different people. Like it was just incredible. But actually, it's actually like it's kind of come full circle because I was in with our, as the doctor for the under 17s women's team back at the start of the year, just kind of when things started opening up again. And we had two girls from Donegal, and you know, one girl was quite shy um, from way more remote than I am. And then you have to bear in mind that these girls they didn't get their under 15, so they've never really even left the house. They've never been away from their parents. And you know, some of the questions they were asking me being like you know I was just kind of be probing them being like what do you want to do for school or did it and oh I don't know like she's Dublin twice a week and you know kind of these these answers yeah. and then come to the end of 10 days and they're like almost different people wow. and what I say to them I was like you know but girls like you're 15 now by the time you're 18 if you're still in the Irish team you might have traveled to at least 10 12 different countries like nobody in your class is going to have done that so you think now you're missing your mommy but seeing this time next year you're going to be running out the door <laughs> See you later. <laughs> you do and like sure I used to get up on the bus mum would leave me the bus quarter past seven bus from Letterkenny up to Dublin airport and then make your way over to the training ground train for four or five hours and then get the bus back home yeah. and we were 13 14 but you know whereas obviously now safeguarding and all that is coming yeah. <laughs> I think they're not more, more appropriate yeah. um, but it is sometimes you just like you know for these kids the experiences like you know I was coming back to secondary schools of 15 16 year olds and then sometimes realizing like you know oh, I am a bit more mature than other people just because yeah. of these experiences and you know pressured situations too like you know we got to the Euro final and as you said went and played in the World Cup you know against a country from different continents as well and being away from home for six weeks at the World Cup yeah. you know at the age of 17 so um yeah there's skills and you know things you just you don't even realize until you're probably my age looking back on them mm-hmm. when, when you enter like a high performing setting like an underage Irish team it was that something that you liked straight away? You was like, I love this level of competitive competitiveness. I love the standard. Or was it something that maybe took a little while to, to get accustomed to? No, again, Orla, as I said, the person I am, I absolutely love this. I was like, this is great. Like, who are all these girls and why are they all so good at football? They beat them. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, I do, because like, back in Dominic there was maybe three or four of us that played soccer, yeah. you know, to that level. Um, and I was playing with all the boys and I was just... But I also, I just went along with things at that age. Um, but it is funny when I talk to some of the girls in the team um, and even Jennifer Byrne, who's, you know, um, Miss Rosa Trilly, um, she's also a qualified doctor. She was on that under 17s team with me. Um, she would have said that she was terrified coming up and, you know, didn't want to come for the first few camps and thought loads of the girls were really intimidating and scary. But like for that, Jennifer would just say that was her personality. And she, again, is from a very small village in Westmeath. Um, but then even like not even if she's my age but she was just saying that within the two or three years involved the team she was like a completely yeah. different person like you know and you even see that coming in now in these little like girls that are quite shy and then yeah even four or five days they're suddenly best friends you know somebody from Cork's best friends somebody from Dublin yeah and like my parents are still best friends with so many of the girls from my team like you know even the recent games they're up staying in Dublin with you know Siobhan Colleen's parents that's lovely <laughs> it's brilliant and their connections that like you know there for life so yeah that's brilliant you took a break and you did play international football but you went in back in as team doctor what was the thinking behind that I know that was kind of the spark that kind of lit your fire again for football yeah so I suppose I was trying to think once I kind of wasn't playing that high level of soccer I was trying to think what I'm going to do with my career and 
So I, I started a master's in sports medicine and wanted to get some you know better experience. And the FAI mm. had come calling to look to ask me to cover some of the underage team stuff, just on a kind of you know ad hoc basis of when the actual team doctors couldn't do it. Mm. So it was brilliant for me getting back and it being mm. an, a footballer at the time to you know you just have a better connection and understanding of how the camps work and what the girls need. Mm. Um, and then I was asked to uh, go up and cover a home base session for the senior team, and I was <laughs> sitting there watching it and I was like. Mm like I probably could play here <laughs> um yeah. knew I was a little bit off like I needed to get back training and that was when I decided so I was playing with Science Swifts at that stage and I wanted to go back to Dublin and play in the National League um and yeah that was kind of my focus then for the last year and a half was to to get back um on the Irish squad and I was absolutely delighted to to get back in the team in June and get my first cap there against Georgia mm-hmm. um so it was the 16th one but just just as sweet as the first I think yeah definitely what's it like I am um, trying to bridge that gap then like I'm always interested yes you have team commitments and you have team training but to improve your game at any capacity in any way what do you do outside of the team environment even now um so for me I think uh you know I've taken a step away back for, or back from from medicine from work I think recovery is a big one I think maybe as the older you get to like you want adaptation from any of your training and when I talk to the girls playing professional, like, you know, they train maybe 30, 40% of the time and rest and recovery is, is a big factor in it. And I suppose when you're working a full-time job, you can't get that, you know, if you're driving two hours to training, you can't get that. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was trying to, you know, just lay, lay off the work, stay off the feet a bit more than I was. Cause obviously, you know, when you're on your feet all day, you know, I was sometimes doing 12 hour shifts and then driving mm-hmm. straight to training and, you know, yes. Yeah, so. yeah, it is. And like you might, do it for a while but I think the older I got I was just like I don't want to do this anymore I've all, I'd also been you know achieving all those things doing it whereas now I wanted to to try and push on and see you know if I can get better yeah. and even at that like you know I've been training with boys I've been doing different things but when you're in camp with the professionals like there is no like you can get up to that level yes but to sustain that level yeah you know, like sometimes, especially in the first one or two camps I was back, I was quite tired at the end of the camp and I was looking forward to a day or two off. Whereas the professional girls were going back to club training the next day and playing a match in three days' time. Right. You know, so there is a big, big difference there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I think just rest and recovery to me is is a big factor of training. Um, you know, training longer and harder is not the same thing as training smarter as well. Um, I think some coaches don't realise that, you know, team sports everyone's in different position as well so training should be tailored differently um and yeah I just think also people need to take onus of their own training and you know what they like and what they don't like and that's obviously very hard in a, in a team environment too when everybody's trying to impress the manager mm-hmm. um but just sometimes I think and it does come with age and it comes with obviously playing experience too but knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you is going to help you you know number one reduce your risk of injury and number two get you better exactly what, what do you find that, that you've picked up from the likes of professional girls is there anything that you, you just watch them doing or any of the girls at all that you, you've picked up for yourself like I, I'm a bit like at training or even I go to watch other teams and I'm, I'm, I'm like stealing everyone's secrets but is there anything that you, you've found maybe over the years you've taken from people that's worked for you um preparation I think is a big one um I think there's you know just turning up at a training pitch isn't you know isn't good enough at the the elite level yeah. um and that's pre- preparation in just organizing your gear bags um nutrition before afterwards um sleeping as well is a big one um yeah it's just little it's kind of like I think I read a, an article or listened to something with Paul Donovan too um and he said, there's no, you know, there's no magic recipe to, to train in. It's just simplicity. And it's just doing the simple things to the best of your ability mm-hmm. over and over again. Um, and that really is, I think, what, you know, kind of high performance professionalism is. Even on the days you don't want to do it, they do it, you know, and you, and you do it to a standard. Um, so, yeah, that's what I've kind of taken away from the girls um, is that, you know, it's, it's an everyday thing. It's not just turn up when you need to exactly that's funny you mentioned that because that's the biggest thing i've learned from the podcast here is there like there's nothing special about the guest it's just they just do the same thing every day right. and when you don't want to go out you still go out have you listened to the high performance podcast at all yes i have oh, yes. they do it they talk about it all the time it's just the yeah. same like it's only not every interview is the same but it's just the same underlying principles the whole time yeah absolutely and you know even yeah as you said if it's not going well for you, you just keep sticking at it and go back the next day and do it again um you know it's, it's a great podcast it's, yeah. It's um, yeah 
out of interest, when you approach a big game um, like Ireland, like the World Cups you've involved, even Crow Park, um, is there anything particularly you do in, in terms of your preparation? Um, I used to be very, very like pedantic about what time I had my food at, but I've become more relaxed in, in, in my older age. Um, just most, hydration is a big thing to me. So in the days beforehand, I would be staying very well hydrated. Um, usually take electrolytes, you know, every every day. Um, and then, yeah, just getting sleep, getting rest and, you know, doing some video analysis as well. I've kind of been trying to get into my game as well. Um, you know, obviously with all the games this year being streamed, um, there's a lot more kind of analysis being done. And yeah, just sleep, rest. And then what I always like to say to myself, um, which doesn't always work, but like, you know, there's always there's time to be nervous. And it's not two days before a big game. It's, you know, it's in the hours before. So even if you're going oh, to bed before, just be like, there's no point in being nervous tonight. It's not till tomorrow. Just breathe and, you know good night and we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant is that something you've just come up with yourself you've been worked or did someone tell you that um it's probably a combination of you know like either reading there and listening to different things but it's it's what i've always kind of done um you know because you know again everybody is completely different um i suppose i actually early only started drinking coffee about two years ago and which is mad i went through the whole medicine and then <laughs> and find this this wonderful potion you're uh, really not care you're, i'm just getting a sense <laughs> just a little bit um but yeah so coffee then you know i i'm sensitive to coffee so i try and go back on the caffeine actually before games and then okay. usually i like to take a cup of an hour beforehand or an hour and a half i'm um, just uh, mainly from the scientific data that it's you know increases kind of alertness and your um you know awakeness of for the game um and supposedly as well your uh, sp- sprint uh, sprint repeatability um but things like that like that took me maybe six months to realize that like okay you do not need these coffees like you were never an anxious nervous person before games and now you are why is that and like but then again you're getting older things start to matter a bit more to you you know you don't have the next 20 years to play um so that's all kind of different factors and yeah i think just again finding your own routine but i think everybody in all walks of life need to be adaptable as well so you need to be able to react to different situations to changing situations and a few of my friends and people i know in both sporting and not in sporting environments find that very hard to deal with like if something is just thrown in front of them whereas i think i learned this from my mother is just taking you know taking a second what is the new situation? Okay, how do we adapt and how do we change and how do we react to that? To that? Brilliant. And I suppose that kind of really did pass on to them both my, you know, hospital working environment, as you know, it can be very, very hectic yeah. and sporting environment too. So Okay, interesting. And when you get to an elite level, I am always interested in this conversation. Is it is football more mental or physical? Um, it really depends on your position, I think. So as a midfielder, yeah, like you know, in big games, I would be, I would be wrecked afterwards because, like, you're on the ball the whole time, and oh, and it's like, you know, some people are way better at talking than others, and I do. Like, I think communication to me is one of the biggest things in team sport, especially in soccer, where things are happening so fast. Mm-hmm. Um, but sure, sometimes you're trying to speak on the pitch, and I could be calling you Kelly or something, or like, you know, <laughs> this word will come out of your mouth, and you're like that is not what I meant because you're so, you know, stimulant yeah. the whole time. Um, and then it is an extremely physical game. I think all female sport is becoming more and more physical. Um, so the tackles are harder, the kicking is harder, everything, you know, the pace of the game has shot up definitely since I last played the National League as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's, again, just kind of re- reiterating that I, I was finding it too hard to balance. Like I have such admiration for some of the girls in the league that are working, you know, full time yeah. and playing to such high standard because it's tiring and it's, it is, it's 24 seven of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But no, like, yeah, just kind of both, I think, have, have improved and both are challenging on the pitch. When you get to that stage and what you've learned, um, just kind of looking at the underage, like when you're involved in Irish teams, is there anything as players that they're looking, they're kind of overlooking, whether it's skill, any attribute that is essential to be to be a top level player? Is there anything that's been kind of overlooked? I think that's one of the special things about soccer. I think that might be more in Gaelic or, you know, say height and basketball, different things. Mm-hmm. But in soccer you know there are so many different positions and there are so many different types of players in positions like I'm only five foot four so I like to tell people I'm five foot five um <laughs> <laughs> but you know and people if they read my you know kind of profile they'd be like oh she's quite small but then on a pitch you would never know that I'm quite small okay where you know other people are are, are taller or stronger or faster but 
there's a place for them on the pitch. There is a place for the smaller, more technical person. Yeah. Um, I do think everyone now though needs to have a le- certain level of fitness, whereas five, 10 years ago, the technical player in midfield might not have to run because they can just stay or the 10 could just stay in the 10 and not move. Whereas, you know, you look, look at Liverpool men, like everything, every single one of those players is running. Mm-hmm. And that's, that is, that's soccer now, you know, you have to be, you have to be physically fit. And same in Gaelic, like, you know, Gaelic mm-hmm. fitness levels are Off the through yeah. yeah they really are mm-hmm. when you talk about I'm always interested as well in, in culture and with the Irish senior women's team especially over the last year like it just seems with the different sports and sponsors that have come in there seems to be a really special high performance culture that wasn't always there we know that from from the previous players um with their campaigns and stuff can you describe the culture that's there at the moment yeah look I think for me coming back as a 20 year eight year old back into the scene after so many years you know it's different than maybe say some of the younger girls like um jessu or emily whelan who are just 18 coming into the scene or, or jesse stapleton who was 16 um but to me the culture is you know i've known a lot of those girls a long time but the culture is very open it's you know if you like you need to show up and you need to be there to work otherwise you won't you won't survive in in that culture but it's it's not that it's you know threatening or you know like yeah definitely like I like that's my opinion anyway is that it's very open and I think all the girls make say or if you came in you were drafted and like every player would nearly make like go out of their way to say hello to you yeah and you know welcome me to the squad and then you know there's 26 27 players in a camp you're not going to be best friends with everybody you're not going to be able to like, not enough time in the day and especially with COVID over the last two years yeah you know, people are kind of in, either in their bubbles or you're you're kind of in your room a lot mm-hmm. um but the professionals and from the girls and even the changes i've seen in the last six years within the team structure are second to none like it's just it's 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 incredible and it's what stirred me on to try and get back and push myself to get up to that level mm-hmm. um, and it's the girls taking what they're learning from their professional environments and bringing it back in and demanding you know even when we get certain things in their team you know there's no like oh my goodness thank you so much this is incredible it's like oh thanks very much also can we have this can yeah. we have this because that's what like you know to, to get better we really demand better and mm-hmm. you know you see that happen now across all female sports and it's great to see but you know there is no of like you know organizations or anyone just kind of giving girls or women stuff to just kind of keep them quiet you know there's yeah. very much an attitude in the Irish camp of thank you but we also you know we want to get better in this aspect we want to get better in this um and you know Katie McCabe is is leading the way in that absolutely and the biggest thing I've I've kind of noted from it is it seems to be like all of this is very player driven like obviously management take into account some of it but even you saying there for example if I was drafted in everyone comes up to say hello that isn't the management saying that that's just the girls taking it upon themselves yeah that's just the girls and i suppose senior environments are a little bit different to underage but you know that's just the girls and that's just you know irish people in general are, mm. are quite nice and it's, it's just great to hear because sometimes you hear from the girls like some of the setups in the uk just are are not as friendly and not as welcoming um both yeah. in club and elite level um so yeah so it's just great to see but i think you know from my experience with most teams in, in ireland everyone is is very lovely and you know there's always that bit of rivalry between clubs but then when you actually meet the person you're like they're actually very good. <laughs> even though you hate each other on the pitch yeah. you're, you're clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly and there's a huge social responsibility I guess with being an elite level player like I was blown away by your fundraiser for Crumlin and Temple Street with the jerseys like that's over 10 grand and I know Sky we're going to donate as well what's mm-hmm. it like having that social responsibility and as an elite level player knowing that we're role models now and you know we have to act a certain way and promote the sport I think with all the recent promotion and media and coverage of the games and stuff, the girl and like we have Gar, Gareth Maher, our media officer, is excellent and he's given us a lot of education and you know keeps us aware of things that are kind of evolving or growing around in the country. And I think everybody has taken you know it, it with you know kind of enjoyment as well and you know kind of relishing in that that profile that you know that we that has now been created for us. And absolutely, I think everybody's so willing with their time. I, I can't explain to you how much Katie McCabe does, like between training, you know, one of the best players in the team and then all the social social media stuff that she has to do and, mm-hmm. you know, things that she has to attend. Like she, she she really is excellent. And, you know, it's even now in the last camp, like I think we, you know, all the jerseys were signed, um, booklets are signed, pamphlets are signed, different things, but it's all just, yeah, again, taking that role in society and trying to be those those mentors for the young girls coming up and I think everyone's enjoying the process so far 
a couple of guests have kind of explained that uh, particularly at the beginning it's kind of when someone comes up to you and say oh you're my hero you're my role model how do you find that if, if a girl comes up to you is it it's a kind of weird now being like I remember looking up to all these players when I was younger and now I have girls looking up to me yeah like and I think it's just great to see because when I was their age I had no real female athletes you know okay. there was there was a girl in town Julianne Herity who I I loved because she's an absolute baller <laughs> um, not she was technically she was just class and in those kind of Wednesday sessions I talked about she would be there but she was about four or five years older than me but like you know kind of at the national level um there is a senior Kira Grant who was the captain of Ireland for a long time so I think I kind of idolized her but mainly just for her namesake no. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never have seen her play you know until yeah. I was maybe 18 19 yeah. um but you yeah, know it's great and like the kids are they're gas they're so funny and stuff they'd be asking for you you know <laughs> I have your finger, and you're like, you really do not want my finger. <laughs> That's class. That's so random as well. The finger, like, oh, anything like your hair around, and you're like, no, you don't. Hair <laughs> bobble. You want to eat my hair tied up? <laughs> Brilliant. And in terms of like um, studying medicine, working in a hospital, and then football, like, is there any sort of transferable skills that you've seen that that's kind of benefited you both, or benefit? Sorry, benefited you in in both areas yeah so again back to the organizational stuff in the hospital like you know you start your day and you have a litany of jobs you need to get done so prioritizing and organizing that communication communication skills is pretty much you know massive in the hospital be that talking to your colleagues patients or you know kind of organ- uh, get excuse me getting things done um and then just dealing under pressure and dealing under stress like both are very can be very stressful environments um and you just have to have a clear head in both those situations so yeah I think um definitely starting my internship I was probably a bit more equipped for the stress um than maybe some of my my colleagues starting who hadn't played in kind of elite level sport yeah um and then also sometimes just seeing the both like you know when you're having a bad day in football you're just kind of like look life can be a whole lot worse um yeah. this this is trivial compared to to what other people have going on and then that, that was sometimes a you know a good way to think about things when you're having a, an off day and training or, or whatever mm-hmm. uh, but yeah no I think sport in general or the, the skills you learn in any type of sport environment um, will transfer to any career you choose. Did you use both as sort of an outlet for one another like obviously medicine would would maybe cancel out football and football would cancel, cancel, uh, cancel out medicine? Yeah, definitely in college. I think it was I, like I just I found my own kind of nice way of doing things, and yeah, it worked out well for myself. But then just at the end, it was just getting you know, it was too much things were because like the football, the game was getting so elite, and then college was obviously ramping up with intensity as well. Yeah. Um, so I just couldn't balance the both. But definitely, as you know, in the earlier years, it was it was a good balance. What do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned from sport so far in your career? um you're not too old to do anything <laughs> <laughs> um lesson learned in sport yeah I literally think that you can achieve like whatever you want to achieve you will achieve it and you might not get there as quick as the person next to you but if you really want it you will get it um and or if you don't get it and you know that you've given everything you've like can to get it yeah then I think you can be happy with that as well because you know sport is competitive it's 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 elite it's you know the next person beside you is just as talented, if not more talented than you. And I think even that high performance podcast, like, yeah, some of these people that we're, they're talking to are not the best in the room. Yeah. We're not the best in the room for a long time, but we're the hardest working. And even growing up, you know, some of the players that would have played with underage who never got a chance until maybe 16, 17 and are now, you know, either playing senior football or, you know, whatever they're doing yeah. because they got it and kept working hard. Mm-hmm, absolutely um can you describe the mentality that's required i'm going to call you a high performer because you've done it in in, in multiple fields at this point like i I've just fascinated by like sort of like i've kind of asked guests for like a checklist of what it what it takes to be at that level and for you particularly across multiple areas um so sorry what was the, the sorry question? so it's kind of like a, a um can you describe the mentality or the attributes that you need to be a high performer okay um so hard working, um, clever in a sense that you do what's you know what you need to do, not what everyone else is doing. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what else? Organized, um, and then you know, kind of not too hard on yourself as well. Yeah. I think you need to have um, you know, you need to be a little bit humble as well, and just 
you're having a bad day, you are just a person, you're having a bad day, give yourself a break. Um, you know, don't go crazy. I, I like, I really hate the ethos and the GA of, you know, train hard for 10 months a year and party hard for two months. Like that is just not sustainable. Yeah. Um, it really, it's, it leads to so many different issues within the GA um, and addicting issues in the GA as well, I think. Um, whereas I always like to have balance and I know it's very cliche of the work hard, play hard. Um, but I used to always in college book myself like a gig. I, I love live music. So like I would book, I book something every three months or you know every oh, 10 cool. weeks yeah and I'd be looking forward to and then I'd be like you know work hard now and then you're going to have a nice night you know on Friday or or going out for dinner or so- something that like I really enjoy yeah if it's just going out for dinner with some of my good friends things like that um you know like even I had assignment due yesterday but I was going to Dermot Kennedy last night so I was like you know get it done and then you're going to go to a gig yeah and, love it. You know, so that's kind of the way I like to, to motivate myself sometimes too yeah that's a good way of looking at it um Overall, from everything you've learned and from across all the areas, I'm interested in this answer, but what would be your definition of success? Oh, Orly, you should have given me some time. <laughs> um, definition of success. Well, that is a hard one. Um, I think to be, I think there's a fine line, like to, to be achieving what you want to achieve, but also pushing yourself be the best that you can be. Okay. So success would be reaping the rewards for your hard work. You know, not really, you know, because you can be successful and not trying, like, you know, but I think to be truly successful as an individual within a team environment is to be, yeah, to be reaping the rewards of kind of the hard work you've put in. Love it. I'm going to move on to the sideline seven. And you've just reminded me that I didn't send you these. So basically it's the same seven questions at the end of every episode. Uh, uh, they're either thought-provoking or fire end, whatever way you want to go with it. So I apologize now that I didn't send them to you. Uh, question question one, what is your favorite quote? Oh, these really should have been sent. <laughs> um, so the one I always say jokingly, but I actually do love is from Find an Emo and it's Dory's Just Keep Swimming. Love it. Um, you know, and if things are going, you know, pear shaped, I always just kind of start singing to my friends, you do to wind them up. Um <laughs> But, you know, like, and yeah. I think it's you know, just keep going is really what I'm saying. But yeah. in, a, in a Dory way. Yeah. Have you seen uh, the movie Soul? Yes, actually. Do you like the one where about the ocean? Do you, did you, remember, do you remember that bit? It's that uh, it's near the end of the movie and it's after he goes through all of that stuff and he finally gets to the gig and he leaves the gig and he's like, this is it. And she says the story about the, the little fish and he goes the older fish and he says where's the ocean he's the older fish is like you're in the ocean he's like no i've not, I'm not i haven't arrived but it is like and but it's kind of fun, funny yeah. to just keep swimming but it's like remember when you're swimming that you're like it's about the now it's not about the ocean do you know what yes, I mean? exactly question two best sporting event you've been to that i've been to um so i went over to watch the fifa world cup in 2019 over in nice Daddy. and it was incredible because I think it was the first time I've been at like a female, you know, led event like that. And it was just ecstatic, like the atmosphere around the city at the games. Oh, it was, it was honestly, it was oh, brilliant. Yeah. Which really, game really. did you go to? We went to two or three games. We The, the best one I went to was a Scotland-England game because so many people were there and it was just mighty crack, like the Scots are mad. Uh, Dead. And it was a great game, and you know, um, Kim Little and Eris Cuthbert would be two of my favorite players as well. And I just, it was, it was brilliant. Dead. Um, really good. I went to Paris, uh, to the US game versus Colombia, and right. with my friend, and it was unreal. And again, it was all female, but it was actually gas because we booked our tickets really early, and we went, got to the stadium, and we were kind of walking down the aisles, and we were like. I go to my friend. I was like, "Oh my god, we're in the front row," because <laughs> we had booked it. We had booked it that early that we were like the first people in the whole stadium to book the tickets. So we had great seats, bad. but it was a great tournament. Like it was really good. Actually, the weirdest thing happened to me. So I was staying in a hostel, um, kind of in like a room of eight people or something by myself, yeah. and there was about six of us there, and I think we had five tickets or something like that and then this guy had just like come out and he was just in from a run or something he was kind of chatting to me and then he's like oh I'm going to the game tonight and it was the France um I think the France England game um or I, France maybe France Norway I can't remember what game it was 
um, which I really should um, answer anyway. But he was saying that he was like, oh, do you need a spare ticket? And I was like, oh, actually I do. And then he was like, oh, look, he's like, I'm over here on business trip. I'm like, my girlfriend was meant to come. She's not here. Do you want this ticket? And I was like, perfect. So I text the group being like, have the final ticket. We're all sorted. So we went down to the beach then and I was opening up the tickets and I was like, what is going on? So I had my individual ticket that yeah. I bought. Yeah. Um, and then this guy had given me his ticket and weren't the two seats right beside each other. <laughs> and I was like, no way. Like this, That's this so funny. Good. Like this, this cannot, have, like this is serendipity to another level. And I was like, like what is happening? And yeah, rightly That's so. Crazy. When you're sitting there and I was like, this is very, very <laughs> Uh, it was, it was, yeah, yeah. It was is nice. there any particular um sporting event on your bucket list oh um i'd love to go see the lions tour um and i'd also love to go to champions league final unreal yeah very yeah. good question three what's been the biggest setback or challenge so far in your career and how did you react to it um so just kind of injuries um you know, at the I get so I played under 19s Ireland for five years, which um, wow, Jesus! Yeah, I was a, I was a baby when I when I joined. I think I was just 15, um, and I played pretty much most of the games, especially in the last three games. And then for our last ever game, my manager dropped me. Um, we should have qualified for the finals, but we didn't. And this game was kind of we were playing Serbia. We weren't going to qualify, okay. um, and. He didn't speak to me. He didn't tell me why. There was there was no communication whatsoever. I was vice captain, and it was just all very strange. And I suppose then, when like I'm a very logical person, and when things that happen that aren't logical, it was very hard to take. Um, you know, or just even the end of my underage international career ended like that. Yeah. He didn't put me on. He didn't. He didn't look at me like it was very. It was. I don't know what was going on, but it was very strange, and still has not been <laughs> settled. As- happened um but I suppose for me then it was kind of and then you finish your underage career and you're kind of like what am I doing next you know obviously seniors is seniors but like you know that's kind of you know dream stuff Mm. um and then you know coincidentally um I kind of done my MCL a little bit after that so I kind of had two little setbacks within you know a couple of weeks um but then fast forward a year or 14 months later and I made my first um uh cap for Ireland so I think that time in my life was a time where I was like, right, Kira, you know, you've not that, you know, you've worked hard to get here, but like you haven't really worked hard. You know, you've kind of, you've got here yeah. doing what you do and just doing it. Whereas now you need to knuckle down. And that's when I started really working with my SNC coach um, and just get myself stronger and fitter. And yeah, with the aim to get back in the Irish team and, and it happened. So I think that was probably the biggest setback. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just, you know, taking the step out and trying to get back into football as well like they're kind of different challenges but yeah so there's, there's been a few but just always with the, the goal in hand and trust and trust in the process when you did take a break from football and you kind of mentioned earlier a little bit about kind of just it becoming a chore and you, you said about playing all your life and unfortunately that's something I'm, I'm going through a little bit with, with Gaelic football at the moment and for me I'm finding it a little bit upsetting that I've done this thing since I was four all I wanted to do was was play football, play football, play football, and I'm falling out of love with it. Did you find that really upsetting that you've put so much time into it and now it's like, well, was it a waste? Did you ever find that at all? Yeah, like, you know, even making that decision to step away, um, you know, I was obviously kind of mental turmoil for the months leading up to it because I knew I was kind of like, I wasn't happy playing football. I didn't really want to go to games. Like, I absolutely loved my teammates, but I was just like, I'm here for the crack. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, it's a weird transition to go through because you're like, what, what is happening? Like, you know, why is this happening? But then I think, you know, again, looking back on it, like stressors outside of football as well, you need to think about it. And it's not just football. It's what's going on with your life at the moment. So like, yeah. you know, or even the, the team environment, the team set up, you know, like sometimes like a lot of girls, I think in Gaelic um, that I've been talking to over the last year or so in county and club level, the pressure is insane and like it's an amateur sport they're asking a lot of people to train like they're full-time athletes and maybe the joy is being sucked out of it a little bit um you know yes that is high level sport but you know it's at some level or at some stage it's going to have to give where people are just enjoying it and you don't have to be you know you know like as you said if you don't want to go running for two hours on a Thursday maybe maybe that's what you need to do because that's a busy week you're having 
but then you know there's just a lot of elements to it but you know it's not a nice phase to go through but i would definitely open up and talk to other people because you'd be surprised about how many people are going through the same thing as yeah well. that's the biggest thing i've noticed and i know a couple of my friends are exact same as what you just said just the pressure gets too much a uh, question four what's been your biggest achievement on or off the pitch um biggest achievement to me personally was getting back on the irish jersey um for the georgia game and yeah and then off the pitch is probably you know becoming a qualified doctor yeah don't, there's no doctors in my family i don't think anybody or even myself at times thought it could happen so yeah that's you know where does uh where does being on the late late rank then how, <laughs> how does that how does that go into it um that's probably up there with all the, the Irish grannies and mammies and aunties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it was. Uh, looking back, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Um, what, what advice would I give my 18-year-old self? Um, maybe don't try and do it all. You know, be in the moment a little bit more than thinking about the next step. Brilliant. Uh, who would be your dream dinner guest and why? And you can open up the table to a few people if you want. Okay. Oh, dream dinner guest. Uh, Roy Keane, definitely. Just for the sheer crack. Yeah. Um, maybe some guests to rile him up as well. Um, so, <laughs> no. Uh, Roy Keane, I've always wanted to. Um, Emma Hayes, the Chelsea manager, I would absolutely love to talk to. She just, her mind blows me away. Um, and Yeah. Maybe them two to start with and then I'd have to think. Brilliant. Uh, Very yeah. good. Final question before I let you go. If your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? Mm. Part two. Part two. <laughs> okay. Because I was going to say, this is already the toughest one and I didn't send it to you. What's yeah. the next, what's part two then? What's to come? Um, Football, maybe football, you know, over um career or okay. football over yeah medicine so maybe okay. the first first the last eight years would be medicine over football and then this one would, would invert and yeah football over medicine brilliant care look thank you so much for coming on i really enjoyed this very best of luck uh, on and off the pitch going forward and i'm looking forward to keeping in touch thanks very much Jordan. i really really enjoyed it A massive thank you to Kira for joining me on the podcast today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I personally took a lot away from it. I just want to wish her the very best of luck with everything on and off the pitch and as she travels to Scotland to play with Rangers Football Club. If you are enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as it does help the show grow. Thanks as always for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.